Hi, I'm Pastor Rob Bryson. Welcome to my video series, Understanding Christianity. Uh, this is part two. If you haven't seen part one, Understanding Christianity to the Fall, go back and check that out because I'm going to kind of pick up where that one left off. Uh, this one is Understanding Christianity, the Rescue. And so I'm going to try to walk you through what it is we Christians believe across the board. I'll talk about some of the differences as well. Uh, so anyway, to get started, so if you were watching the video of the fall, you understood that we left off with this idea that humankind, uh, because of sin, has been separated from God. And something spiritually died in us uh, from the get-go when Adam and Eve fell. And of course, we all have sins of our own. Now, it's not to say that there isn't still this traces of the image of God. The image of God is still with us and on us and and somehow we still bear a little bit of his image, this longing to know God. And God is here. He's a triune being. He's, he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons in one being. The being is God. And so three persons in one. And uh, one God, three persons, not three different gods. We talked about that also with Paul. So Establishing at the end, here we are as human beings, and there's a gulf that separates us. Because of sin, there's a separation from God. We're no longer connected to Him, not able to hear Him or understanding or connect with Him. And uh, we have this problem, and that we're stuck in this sinful condition, and that sin separates us from God. So let's talk just for a little bit about what it means to be in this sinful condition. What does the Bible teach about it? So if you got a Bible, grab it if you want to, and you can follow and double check. I always encourage you to double check anything I'm going to say against what the Bible actually says, but you can find and download. But I'm going to be throwing some Bible verses at you to talk about this. So the first thing we learn is that um, when we're in this sinful condition, that we are dead. There's something in us. The spirit in us is dead. Here's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature... We were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. So from the get-go, we're kind of learning, okay, there's a problem, is that our sins has caused the spirit in us to die. Our soul and our bodies are still alive, but the spirit that connect with God is dead. Also, that verse indicates that when Adam and Eve were in the garden as humans, they were the rulers that were given dominion of the earth. Something happened in the sin where uh, Satan the devil took over and became the prince of this world and humanity lost its control and surrendered it to the evil forces. So that's in there as well. And that then by nature, we couldn't help but keep sinning because the spiritual dead part in us could no longer see or hear or understand God. Second thing we're gonna learn is that we're always, uh, we're always falling short. So that means when we try, when we try to do things God's way, when we try to be good, when we try to build civilizations that work and societies that, that don't have evil in them, we always fall short. And we as individuals are always falling short. And here's a verse for that. It's Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. It says, Now we know that whatever the law says, and the law would be the Bible, God's word, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, but that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So Paul, the apostle Paul was saying in Romans, it's like God gave his rules, God gave his plans, God gave out his structures in the for how he wanted society and individuals to live. And all it did was show us over and over and over how often we cannot do it. We cannot keep up. We can't make it. And so when God's rules came, he was showing us how far the distance is, the gulf is between us and him, because no matter what we try to do, we don't get it. And then in verse 23, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So when we try to bridge the gap and reach God, we all fall short. The third thing is that, uh, that we're, we learn when we're in this sinful condition is that we are actually infected with sin. So we are completely, not just uh, a little bit, 
But actually, this sin is a major infection. It's a problem that we have. Uh, Isaiah chapter 65 uh, verses uh, beginning in, or 64, sorry, Isaiah 64 verses 5 through 7 say this. But you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. When our display, when we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Yet no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore, you've turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. So this whole idea that when we even try to do good, the things that we do that are, that are attempts to do good, when we have this image of God that we kind of vaguely understand, but we're usually corrupted in some way with a selfish motive or whatever. It's like, well, even when we try to do good, we our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. We can't get to God. Now, honestly, compared to each other, we can be pretty good. Compared to each other, yeah, if we're compu- comparing human to human, we can always look at some other lady, some other guy, and say, oh, I'm, I'm better than her, I'm, I'm better than him. Oh, I'm not as good as her, though, I'm not as good as him. On a comparative level, sure, we can be a slightly higher standard. But the issue is, how are we compared to perfect holiness, righteousness of God? That's where we fall short. That's where it shows that, oh, we are messed up. And so that's what Christianity teaches. We're dead. We are always falling short of God's glory. We're infected with sin. And that perpetuates this gap, this separation from God that we simply cannot bridge. And so then the question would be, well, what, what does this separation mean? What, what's here, right? And the Bible would teach that, well, this separation, the end result of it is actually death. Now, it does mean, yes, both a physical death as well, but a spiritual death. When the Bible speaks of death, it doesn't just mean that your body, you know, stops breathing and stops working and the cells in your body end. Uh, It means, yes, your soul does depart from the body. But the real issue is that death in the biblical terms is total separation from God. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. Love it. So like all of this being the problem is, what does it earn us? What does it get us in the end? It gets us death. Same verse, though, gives us a little ray of hope. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, I know that it kind of sounds like, okay, separated from God, I'm I'm still like, aren't we always in that condition? What's the difference? It's like, well, we are still in some sort of uh, sense where God is still wooing us and calling us. The end result of staying forever trapped in this and going to the place where our bodies die and our souls uh, depart that end is this death, and this death is total separation from God. Okay, so what does it mean that the wages of sin is death and death is separation from God? What, what does that really mean? Well, it means that God basically gives us what we deserve, which is he removes himself. He separates 100% everything that he is from us. And if God is love, that means we get the opposite. He removes love and you get its opposite, which is hate. He removes light, we get darkness. He removes joy, we get sorrow. He removes companionship and friendship and we get loneliness and despair. At every turn, if God removes all of the good things that he is, we get what's left over, the negative, the opposite of God. And actually, for some of us, that's the wish we have is, I don't want you, God. And God says, okay, then I'll just remove myself. And you get what's without, what what is left over. That's the condition we call hell. Hell is that complete separation from God where he finally will remove himself from us. And it's, you know, obviously when you think about it, it's a terrible, terrible ending. And he has a plan instead to create a rescue. But we're helpless. We're hopeless because we're stuck dead, we're falling short, we're infected with sin, we cannot do this ourselves. And the beauty of this good news, this gospel, the story of Christianity is that what we couldn't do, God did. He took action. Out of the love of the Father, the story of Christianity is that this person of the Trinity, the Son, God the Son, Jesus Christ, he willingly agrees that he will Uh, disrobe his glory and he will come to earth and he will be born as a human being 
And as a human being, his destiny is to die on a cross, and he will be paying the price for humanity. Let's look at a few Bible verses just to make sure we're on the right track, right? Just because that's going to always be, this is where the Bible teaches this. So, John 3.16, probably one of the most famous Bible verses that there is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, God gives his Son, and we use the word Son in our culture that will mean, you know, that means a totally separate, different person. Biblical words, the son of means same as. So that's, he gives himself, he gives himself to pay this price. Romans 5 verses 6, uh, 6 through 8 says, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then Philippians chapter 2, great passage. It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. So although he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is a beautiful passage that talks about, okay, so here's Jesus continually existing in the Trinity, in the form of God, being with God, a substance with God, and he willingly decides he's going to disrobe from his deity, and he's going to descend to the earth, and he's going to be born into a human body. And as when he's born into a human body, it's very interesting because then he's going to take on humanity. This is the thing we call the incarnation. That when Jesus was placed in Mary's womb, that he was fully God and fully man. He had a human body, he had a human mind, a human will, and human emotions. But simultaneously, he's fully God at the same time. But he's choosing to restrict his deity to... Uh, I guess you would say to hold it in check. Uh, it'd be the similar if like you said, I have the power of sight, I can see. Uh, obviously wearing glasses, not so good, but I can see. So if I chose to blindfold myself and walk around as if I was blind, we would know that, okay, for all intents and purposes, you're living and acting and behaving with the restrictions of a blind person, but I would still have the power of sight. So when Jesus is incarnate in the human flesh, he still has all his deity, but he chooses to restrict it. He has it, but he's restricting it to walk the earth as a human being, to live in human flesh and demonstrate to us how God would be as well as how humanity should respond to God. So he's simultaneously showing us God and showing us how humanity should act in relationship to God. And it's crucial to understand he's sinless. He never commits a sin. And as a consequence, see, if he sinned, then he actually falls short. He's dead. He's infected with sin. He has the same Adam and Eve problem, and he's over here with the rest of us, and he's disqualified. But because he was sinless, he could die on the cross, and he could pay the price that human beings owed. The wages of sin was death. Human beings needed to pay the price and the and receive the punishment, the, the wrath of God, as it was said in that early passage I read, gets poured out on humanity. And he's taking it, but because he's God, he's also simultaneously big enough to cover all the sins of all humanity. So he dies on the cross for humanity, paying the price for humanity, and offering the escape from this position and offering the path out of death and hell that no other means can accomplish. Only he can accomplish that. And so the answer then is, okay, so if he's paying the price and he's sinless, then what? how does this whole thing work for me, right? How does it work for me? And here is the some Bible verses to listen to. It says, John 3, 1 through 6. So there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. 
This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And in Acts 2, verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 say, In him you also trusted. You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Titus 3, verses 4 through 6. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness that we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And Romans 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Okay, so here's what putting all that together means. So all of that is saying, once you understand that Jesus was both God and fully human, and he dies on the cross for our sins, that recognition means that we then, as human beings, make this, we call it a decision, we call it being saved, but we come to recognize this truth, and we end up crossing over to this sense of, okay, now I'm with God. And the thing that died, that was with Adam and Eve that died, actually is rebirthed in us. And that's the Holy Spirit. Now the third person of the Trinity is placed inside of us. And that which died with Adam and Eve is brought back to life again. It is born again. It is restored. It is regenerated. It's renewed. The Spirit of God indwells in us. And that which died with Adam and Eve is canceled out and something new happens. And so we find ourselves then saying, ah, I've been rescued by what Jesus did. Now the Holy Spirit lives inside of me here. And I begin to hear God's voice and know God and understand God and be able to receive information from God and be able to pray to God and worship God and be in a relationship with God that fell when Adam and Eve fell. And I'm granted access to God the Father through what Jesus did and through the birth of the Holy Spirit inside. There is a continuing problem, though, that exists for us. And one of the things that exists for us is we've now lived a lifetime in this sinful condition. We've built up habits and we've built up practices. We've believed lies about ourselves, lies about others, lies about the world we live in. We are corrupted and have lived in corruption for so long that now these patterns of behavior are still lingering in us and they're still on us and they're still with us. In some way, the old way that we have been is still with us. Even though we've been renewed inside, we have a lifetime of patterns that live the old way. And so this problem is still in us. Now the Bible has words for it. They call it the flesh. It's called the carnal man. It's called the old nature. It has these terms for the way you have lived for so long is still lingering. You've been renewed inside, but still now there's this pattern to break. And the gospel story is that once you've been renewed, you begin to move further on. And you don't just stay at this point of, I just uh, I've received salvation from the Lord and I'm good to go. But slowly now, over a lifetime, you begin to bring this old dead habit, this bad person, this destruction habit. So we've had the lies we believe. You bring them back to the cross and you have to sometimes re-crucify that self, so to speak. It means put to death some of the things that were like, oh, I've got a way of dealing with, oh, I don't know, maybe the opposite sex or maybe with 
authority figures or maybe even something about myself. And I have to bring that back to the cross and say, hey, that old way of thinking, it's got to go. It's got to die. That is a lifelong process. And over and over, we see the Holy Spirit moving and changing and transforming us as we begin to get rid of the old flesh, get rid of the old man, change the carnal nature, and grow into becoming more and more and more like who Jesus was. That's the Christian life. Okay, so makes sense so far. Now, a couple of things to say about that. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about this, this pattern. So we have theological names for a lot of this stuff. Uh, this situation here is when we avoid the death, the separation from God by believing in Jesus, we actually call that justification. We're justified. That means it's like to be declared righteous. That is a one-time event where like the, the gavel of the judge comes down and it hits and says, innocent, you're declared innocent. Jesus paid for every sin you had ever committed, ever did commit in the past, or ever will commit in the future. And he paid for those sins, and you are justified and declared righteous in that moment. That's a thing that happens. And then oftentimes, you'll hear us Christians will use phrases like, well, that's when I made a decision for Christ. That's when I was got saved. Or that was the night I met Jesus. We have these phrases that we might use. What it means is that's the moment I believed in who he was and what he did. And I gave him my life, and I asked him to cover all of my sins. That's usually a moment in time. Often, that's, mostly it's a memory that people have of a single event that took place when they would say, that's when I believed. We would use the phrase, that's when I got saved. However, we also know that now there's this growth process that happens. And this growth process is like, okay, now I got to change everything I was. And it comes through repentance and, and moving forward. And uh, this, this process is called sanctification, sanctified. So this process is a lifelong process where we become more and more holy, more and more righteous, start thinking more and more the way God thinks and doing things that God would do, thinking and acting more in Jesus's lifestyle. This is a long process, and this is something that happens over a lifetime. Now, what Jesus would say is, if you don't see this process happening, probably this belief never happened. He calls it, in his thing, he called it fruit, right? You shall know a tree by its fruits. He would say, you know, a bad tree doesn't bring forth bad fruit. So he says, if you don't see a process of this sanctification happening in someone's life, no matter what their mouth says or their words say, probably this never happened. Because if this happens, this process becomes inevitable. It may be long and slow. It may take a while but becomes inevitable. This is a whole lifetime. And eventually, the final destiny is for all of us when we shed this mortal body and our souls are then, um, we leave our body and our spirits have been renewed and reborn, then at that point, we get to join with God. And we're given new bodies, glorified bodies. And of course, that is the glorified. Well, I'm going to keep it in this other color because that's what I've been doing, right? So glorified, and that's where we finally shed all of the old habits permanently. The sanctification process is over, and so we talk about being justified, sanctified, and glorified. And sometimes the Bible will say, you have been saved. Sometimes it talks about you are being saved, and sometimes it talks about you will be saved. And so what it means is you've been justified, you're being sanctified, you will be glorified. And so this is the final destiny. And we all finally get to enter back into the full fellowship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit when we're in heaven. And it says that when the final day of all human history ends, that what God will do is remake the heavens and the earth and restore the paradise that was lost with Adam and Eve. And there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. He will wipe away every tear. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no pain. There'll be no suffering. And everyone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ will end up with him in the new heaven and the new earth. Okay, so all Christians would say, yeah, th this is what we believe. Th this is it. Yeah, this is the story of Christianity. This is the doctrine of Christianity. This is the belief system of Christianity. Now, there are things we'll disagree about. 
For instance, there's something, you know, we all believe in water baptism. At some point, water baptism happens, right? That's in our Bible. So we'll argue about, well, do you add the water here, right? Do droplets of water get placed on here? Or do you get immersed here? And th does that need to happen to bring you over? Or do you wait until someone's been over here and then the droplets of water get added? Then you do the baptism. Does that happen after or before? We'll argue about that. That should, you know, some, some, uh, Christians believe that, well, you can't come over all by yourself and just make this decision on your own. The church has to be the one to bring you across. Catholics would say that. Um, we'll argue about, okay, I understand the Holy Spirit does give us a rebirth, but does the, when does the Holy Spirit actually start that process? Because is it wait until after we've made this decision and we have decided we believe in Jesus? Or does the, actually the Holy Spirit begin somehow over here moving on our lives in and around and through us? Is he drawing us? Is he wooing us across? We'll argue about a little bit of that process. Do we make a decision? Do we have free will in this? How much free will do we have? Was he wooing us all this time? Can we resist him if he is wooing us and trying to draw us to Jesus? Can we resist him and how much can we resist him? We'll argue about that. Uh, we'll argue about whether or not, even after you've been reborn, is there an additional then uh, thing he gives at some point where he has this even extra big power that he bestows on humanity? It's given some time after the fact, after you've been saved. Does he do a new infusion, even more of himself? We'll argue about whether that happens. We'll argue about, hey, if you've made this decision, you're over here, can you lose this whole thing? Can you live in such a way that because you're not moving in sanctification, you actually fall back here and find yourself all the way back here, starting all over again because you lost your salvation and you're back here? We'll argue about that. But we don't argue that this basically is the story, that the Son of God, who was fully God, became incarnate, fully man, and his death on that cross pays for our sins. We acknowledge that we are sinners in need of a Savior, we are stuck here. We acknowledge that. That's repentance. Repentance, we turn from what we believed before into something we believe new. And that crosses us over to this other side. Here's a couple of Bible verses regarding that. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart one believes into righteousness and with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So interesting that it, those verses, particularly that, that uh, Romans verse mentions, that we believe with our heart. You'd think that they would say, oh, if you acknowledge it with your mind, if it's a mental ascent, then you're saved. It's uh, something deeper. It's something about the emotional connection, something deeper in our soul and spirit to know, I believe this. Yeah, my mind's a part of it, but something deeper in my soul believes this. And I understand fully what's going on here to receive salvation. It's a belief in Jesus that permeates down to my core. And the confession of sin is huge to say, I know I need the Savior. That's a major part of it. Oftentimes what we... Christians, or certainly we Protestants do, uh, is, is we could say, yeah, I know that the Bible says, just believe this is true, and you're saved, and yet we feel a little more, I don't know, we just feel more comfortable if we say there's a moment when you can identify and say, oh, there was a time when I prayed, and I acknowledged I was this, in this condition, I accepted what Jesus offered me as a free gift, and I invited the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of me. We have a, we will sometimes refer to it as a sinner's prayer. We'll refer to it as a prayer of salvation. We'll refer to it as a time when we could say, that's the time when I, I didn't just like cognitively be aware of it, but I actually took a step at some level and invited God to do this work in me. So here's what I want to do. I'm just going to pray a little prayer, which would be an example. And if that's something you feel that you would like for yourself, find your own words, but here might be an example. So here it would be a prayer. Lord Jesus, I understand that you are fully God. And then when I talk to you, I'm talking to the Father and that your spirit is at work as well. For you are three and you three are one. And I look at myself and I know that I fall so far short of who you are. 
and I am in desperate need of you to save me. I look at the end result of where things will go if I continue my own way without you, and I, I don't want that destiny. And I repent of my sins, the things that I have done to harm myself and harm others. I'm sorry that life worked out the way it did. I, if I could have been better, I would have been better. But I know that I can't be. I need your help. And Jesus, I understand now that you have paid the price for all of my sins. And I invite you to come and live in my life. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, renew me. I accept your sacrifice on my behalf. And I ask that you regenerate my soul, my spirit that you rebirth in me what was lost and give me the ability to hear and know and understand you. And I know it will be a lifetime of learning and training, developing, making me more what you want me to be and I'm surrendering what I wanted to be. Will you save me in this, Lord? And will you one day, because I know your word already promised it, you'd seal me for the day of glorification the day when it will all be redeemed and I'll be able to stand with you forever in heaven. And so, Lord, this is my prayer. Forgive me of my sins. Pay the price for them. Renew me by the power of your Spirit. Live inside of me and change my life. And I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That might be the way I would do it. You'd have words of your own to use. And I'd highly recommend find a spot in a space where you do such a thing. You acknowledge your sin, you repent of it, you acknowledge Jesus' death for you, and you invite the Holy Spirit to come and live in with you, knowing you're in for a lifetime of change and transformation. But the, the ride is worth it. I'm Pastor Rob Bryson. This has been Understanding Christianity, The Rescue. There'll be a few more videos in this series, and I encourage you to check those out. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.